Hey there everybody, you know what time it is. It's time for another Strange and Bizarre Cases compilation. If you don't know what these videos are, this is where I take all of the cases that I come across that aren't really long enough to be their own video, but are definitely worth talking about and compile them all into one video. Once again, thanks to Unwise Blood on Twitter for providing a lot of these stories. I don't know how you come across so many. With that said, let's get into it. Right here we've got, Man Rejected by Model Goes on Stabbing Spree. A 30-year-old model named Aliona Shakova was working on her new clothing brand doing a modeling shoot in April of 2023. This was when she would come to meet a 26-year-old man named Jared Breviza. Jared managed to convince Aliona to take some pictures with him, whereupon he immediately began hitting on her to an uncomfortable degree. In addition to promising that he would help her brand take off, bragging about his connections in New York, he also told her that he could marry her, saying, I'm gonna be a good husband, you're gonna be my wife, even saying that they should have some kids. Aliona wasn't really interested, later saying, I think he liked me and he was used to getting what he wanted. Regardless, the two did take pictures together and they were even uploaded to Instagram. He invited her back to the hotel pool to talk afterwards. Jared continued to brag about how wealthy he was and sent her pics of his vacation spots. He even offered to open up clothing stores for her in several different cities across the United States. Aliona, feeling that this was pretty overwhelming, left the hotel that night. After texting a few times, she continued to get skeevy vibes from the guy and eventually cut off all contact with him. It wasn't too long after that that Jared would completely go off the rails. One fateful day, Jared made his way to an AMC movie theater in Boston, Massachusetts at 6pm. Entering without a movie ticket, wearing a long trench coat and a blonde wig, he entered into a theater while saying nothing and approached a crowd. There, he would pull out a 10-inch knife and stab four girls, aged everywhere from 17 to as young as 9 years old, completely unprovoked. Then, he would run out and hop back into his car, driving to a McDonald's about 30 miles away in Plymouth. Wearing nothing under his trench coat, apparently, he flashed the restaurant before once again pulling out his knife, slashing a 21-year-old woman and a 29-year-old man. One of the witnesses told the news, It's so heartbreaking, that's what I'll be thinking about the rest of the night is seeing those kids coming down the steps and just crying. They looked really stunned like they just saw a horror movie, not a kid's movie. Luckily, after being transported to the hospital, it was found that the girl's injuries weren't life-threatening. The same goes for the two people at the McDonald's who also survived. The police were able to check CCTV footage and find Jared's license plate number. Spotting his car on the road, they attempted to pull him over. He wasn't about to go down that easy, leading them on a wild car chase. Eventually though, Jared crashed his Porsche in Sandwich, Massachusetts where he was caught and taken into custody. He's facing multiple charges of assault with intent to murder. He is also suspected of another murder that had been discovered recently, that of Bruce Feldman, a 70-year-old man who was found dead in his home shortly before the stabbing spree. Aliona is now counting her blessings, happy that she bailed when she did. She said, I couldn't imagine at that moment what he was capable of. I am still in shock after reading about what he has done. I feel blessed to be alive. There are so many crazy people, we have to be really careful. You never know. Jared was recently arraigned on one count of assault to murder, two counts of assault and battery, and indecent exposure. He is currently being held in custody for a mental health evaluation. Here we have, Missouri mother tried to sacrifice son before killing him and her daughter. So a while back, a 36-year-old woman named Ashley Parmelli posted to Facebook about her struggles with depression, writing, I isolated myself. I came off as very timid and unfriendly, and in all reality, I needed a friend more than anything. Always questioning if the kids would be happier or better off without me being their primary caregiver because I knew that they deserved a much better role model. Little did anyone know, those thoughts were more than just mere thoughts. After not too long, Ashley was going to be acting out these dark desires. Friends and family grew more concerned with her apparent mental health problems, taking note that she had changed her profile pictures to nothing but a black screen. That same day, Ashley threw her two kids, a two-year-old son and a nine-year-old daughter, into her car. Ashley has since said that, before getting into the car, she had tried to sacrifice her son, but it's unknown what exactly she meant by that. She drove a ways away from home and stopped the vehicle. 
This is when witnesses in the area heard gunshots. She had done the unthinkable and shot her two kids right there. To her surprise, though, her two-year-old son was still alive. She drove a little farther north to the Timber Creek Resort, took him out of the car, and drowned him in a fountain. Ashley then drove about 13 miles away and walked into the Festus Police Department and told the officers working there that she had just killed her two kids. The police found her daughter, still in the car, unresponsive with a gunshot wound. They then went to search for her son. He was later found floating in a water fountain and pronounced dead at the scene. Initially, she was charged with second-degree murder. However, it wasn't long after that that the charges were up to those of first-degree murder after the police heard more of the details. Both of the kids' fathers were shocked to hear about what had happened, to say the least. They never felt any negativity surrounding the kids or their mother. A candlelight vigil was held that same evening for both of the kids. At what would have been her daughter's softball match, they released a bunch of balloons in the sky in her honor. Friends of the girl never noticed that she seemed unhappy, and she never mentioned having any trouble at home. It seemed that everything happened very suddenly. GoFundMe accounts were set up to pay for both of the kids' funeral expenses. This one is... Pregnant mom of four with a mostly empty bottle of Crown Royal slams into 16 pedestrians. So out in Michigan, an absolutely plastered pregnant mother decided to hop into her car, Crown Royal bottle and antidepressants in hand, and go for a drive. As you might expect, 35-year-old Ashley Monroe didn't get too far. At 6.30pm that Saturday night in Watertown Township, a town about 15 miles from Lansing, she peeled out and crashed into a small crowd of people. She hit 16 people, and she hit them so hard that the front end of her car suffered massive damage. The carnage at the scene was so extreme that blood, hair, and tissue were embedded into the grill of Ashley's car. With the vehicle somehow still functioning, she continued driving for about 13 more minutes before the police caught up to her and stopped her in her tracks. She was pulled over and found to have a blood alcohol level of 0.183, more than twice the legal limit, along with a now-empty bottle of Crown Royal and two bottles of antidepressants there in the front seat. Two of the victims, 30-year-old Jonathan Esch and 42-year-old Daniel Harris, died right there on the scene. Their injuries were simply too severe. Fourteen other people, with ages ranging from as young as two to as old as 61, were also rushed to the hospital. One of them, a 38-year-old woman, was in critical condition. Luckily, these 14 came to survive. Ashley was hit with several charges. She's got two counts of operating while intoxicated and failure to stop at the scene of an accident when at fault causing death. This is in addition to six counts of operating while intoxicated causing serious injury and one count of failure to stop at the scene of an accident resulting in serious impairment or death. She was hit with a bond of $500,000, being deemed a serious risk to society. Ashley's attorney tried to get pity by pointing out that she is the mother of four kids, aged 1, 7, 11, and 13, and was pregnant with another child who was soon to be born. He pointed out that she was also a loyal worker at the Michigan Secretary of State's office. It didn't work. The judge actually doubled the bond, setting it at a million dollars. The judge said, what the court knows for sure is we have two individuals that died. Two people have lost their lives prematurely. We're not just talking about a victim, we're talking about multiple victims. Ashley remains in jail, unlikely to ever be able to post that kind of bond. Her hearing has been postponed to August due to the massive amount of evidence that the police are going to have to comb through beforehand. It's very likely that her prison sentence will be no less than heavy. Oh boy, here we have... Horror video shows trans woman allegedly run over man, then kiss his body and stab him nine times. Alright, so here's a story that's guaranteed to piss off everyone on all sides of the political spectrum for wildly different reasons. This comment section is definitely going to be a war zone with a headline like that, but that is actually how a lot of these news sites out there reported the issue, so here we go. Anyway, this story started when a 64-year-old man named Steven Anderson in Houston was walking down his driveway to his mailbox ready to grab the Daily Mail. This was when a white car came speeding down the road and swerved in order to purposely hit him. The car then flew into reverse to strike Steven once more, pushing him further back down the street. Several onlookers came out and pulled out their phones to get evidence of the crime while others tended to Steven's wounds. 
That is, until the driver of the car, 20-year-old Karen Fisher, hopped out and walked over to the victim. Karen then flipped Stephen over, began to straddle the body, kissed him, and then pulled out a knife before stabbing him nine times. Karen then, instead of getting back into the car, fled the area on foot. The witnesses were left baffled as they waited for emergency services to arrive. Stephen did not survive, losing his life there on the spot. Karen was caught a while later wearing nothing but a black bra and booty shorts. The case was already crazy enough, but the news media went into even more of a frenzy when Karen was listed as being male on court records but referred to as female by police, bringing a whole new element of shitstorm to an already weird case. Karen, who had already been charged with both prostitution and evading arrest right before this, was now hit with charges of murder, evading arrest with a vehicle, and assaulting hospital personnel. Two of the witnesses at the scene of the crime said, it's very disturbing. I have kids here. They could have been out there playing. And broad daylight. It happened right under our noses. This one is... Alea Baldwin arrested after allegedly throwing used tampon at bartender. So here we have a really weird and gross story involving none other than the sister-in-law of Justin Bieber, Alea Baldwin. I would like to thank Alea personally for giving me this segment as it is truly a blessing. Out in Savannah, Georgia, Alea was arrested for assault and battery after a night out on the town. She had went out for a fun night, hitting up Club Elan, a nightclub along the waterfront on River Street. She was having a great time until she started to feel sick, causing her to hit up the bathroom multiple times at the establishment. Given that she was taking up the only bathroom by herself for the majority of the night, she was asked to leave several times. Well, she didn't take too kindly to that. The 31-year-old party girl then ripped out her bloody tampon and chucked it at the bartender before attempting to beat up club bouncers. Well, police officers were on the scene very shortly, with one bouncer informing them that he had been hit in the genitals while another stated that some of his hair had been ripped out. Seeing evidence of this, the cops threw Alea into cuffs and escorted her from the scene. She was accused of simple assault and battery, criminal trespassing, and battery. She was thrown into the Chatham County Detention Center, where she soon posted bail. She then returned to Los Angeles, continuing life as normal, appearing on social media as if nothing ever happened. The bartender will likely have to attend some therapy after this one. Here's a wild one. Serial Dine and Dash couple jailed for a total of 20 months. Here we've got the story of a couple living out in the UK, 41-year-old Bernard McDonough, a father of six, and 39-year-old Anne McDonough. The two had each made over 43 fake identities and used 18 different birth dates to pull off their scam of choice, dining and dashing. They were no strangers to crimes such as this, with Bernard having a rap sheet consisting of charges of theft, while Anne similarly had multiple charges relating to fraud, theft, and obstructing a police officer. Usually, the family would go out to eat at restaurants where they would order luxury meals, specifically meals that Anna has said they couldn't normally afford, before handing waitstaff a card that they knew would be declined. They would then say, oh, my bad, let me go get my cash and come back, while leaving their kids in the restaurant, making them appear unsuspecting. However, after they left, the kids were told to wait in the restaurant for a few minutes before fleeing themselves. Restaurant owners noted that they would order huge amounts of food for the kids as well, much of which they couldn't even eat, leading to them wasting exorbitant amounts of food as well. They didn't limit their crimes to sit-down restaurants either. On at least one occasion, they ordered food out to their house where they grabbed the food from the delivery driver's hands, uh, slammed the door in his face, and refused to pay him. The two were finally apprehended when they were caught red-handed on CCTV, stuffing themselves with T-bone steaks and tiramisu at an Italian restaurant before running off. These restaurant owners uploaded the video to social media, getting 12 million views, leading to the couple being identified and caught. They were arrested soon after, quickly admitting to five dine and dashes and four offenses related to shoplifting after it came to light that they had also stolen from Tommy Hilfiger, Sainsbury, and Tesco stores. Anne was quick to say that eating these meals she couldn't afford without paying made her feel better about herself, somehow. It was found that, at only five of the restaurants they had ripped off, they had stolen well over 1,200 pounds worth of food, or about 1,500 freedom bucks. Anne claimed that she was nine months pregnant and was released from custody on doctor's orders, only for it to come to light that she wasn't actually expecting. 
The two had to move out of their home when a bunch of angry townspeople, infuriated at their shenanigans, came over to their home and broke all their windows. The couple soon appeared at the Swansea Crown Court, where they were called cynical and brazen fraudsters for what they had done. Anne showed up in a glitter-covered jacket, bursting into tears as she got sentenced to 12 months in prison. Bernard himself showed very little emotion when he was sentenced to 8 months. It appears Anne got the longer sentence because of the shoplifting. The judge, Paul Thomas, said that they both seemed to get a buzz from their crimes, acting out of pure and utter greed, adding that he was mainly jailing them for the way they ruthlessly exploited their kids during their devious plans. The judge said that Anne was the leader of the schemes and, quote, a fluent and practiced liar, while it seemed that Bernard showed remorse for his crimes. Now we've got... Florida man wearing women's blouse, no pants, crashes car into jail to kill everyone. Here we have that essential Florida man story that everyone craves, and you'll be happy to see that this is a pretty weird one. In this story, a 40-year-old man named Joseph Leedy threw on a woman's blouse and nothing else, hopped into a truck, and drove it through the wall of the Martin County Jail's lobby. The truck got lodged halfway through the windows and ended up with all of its own doors torn off. Joseph then hobbled out of the car and began to pour motor oil all over the ground, saying that he was going to light it all on fire. He then pulled out some rubber snakes from somewhere and threw them all over the ground to startle the police. He then continued to threaten everyone there, saying that he was there to kill everyone. When the police and fire rescue came to subdue him, he fought back as well as he could. Luckily, nobody was even in the lobby at the time and nobody got hurt. Joseph didn't really do anything but cause thousands of dollars in damage and get himself into a whole lot of trouble. He was taken back into the hospital under the presumption that something was wrong with him, where it was said that he was anything but cooperative. He was charged with four counts of aggravated assault on a law enforcement officer and criminal mischief of over $1,000. He was then sent back to that very jail as an inmate. And uh, here we have... Black Lab ingests meth at Gillette Park, wags tail a thousand miles per hour. This is the story of Tater, a black lab who loves meth. Every day Tater's owner, Michael, would take him to the Dalby Memorial Park and do a lap around the lake, throwing tennis balls and having a great time. Little did he know that he was going to throw that tennis ball into a drop spot. Tater ran off into the distance to get the ball, but while doing so, he somehow ingested a whole bunch of drugs, with his owner saying, so I guess when Tater was returning the tennis ball, he somehow ingested methamphetamine. Saying that nobody is sure whether Tater ate it, or snorted it, or pulled out a pipe and smoked it. Either way, it was now in the dog. The walk continued for about 40 more minutes until the man and his dog came home like any other day. However, on this day, Tater was acting a bit weird. It was said, his tail was wagging a thousand miles an hour, thumping on the hardwood floor. While Tater would normally crash and take a nap after a walk, this time he was very excited and staring off into space at the same time. He was happy and restless, swinging his head back and forth. Eventually, his weird behavior was concerning enough for the family to take him to the vet. After a quick check, it was decided that he needed a drug test. It wasn't long before the blood test showed that our favorite dog was a meth fiend. He was then taken to an emergency vet clinic in Rapid City that could watch him overnight. Meanwhile, the police combed the park to find the rest of the drugs, but they never found anything. It's possible that Tater had eaten it all. One of Tater's owners said that at least he got into it and came out fine, rather than a little kid getting into it. After getting sedated and getting some food and water, Tater was just perfectly fine. He's now back to normal and hopefully won't need to go to rehab. And this one is... Man pleads guilty to making 12,000 harassing calls to Congress members. A man living out in Queens, New York, really didn't like Congress, and he made that pretty evident over time. For 18 months between 2022 and 2023, he made over 12,000 calls to Congress offices, slowly driving them crazy over time. This is when 35-year-old aide Salim Lilly began this harassment campaign in February of 2022 and never did stop. He made his thousands of phone calls to about 54 different congressional offices all over the United States, half of which were directly made to offices in Washington, D.C. He began to place the calls while he was living in Maryland, but he soon moved out to Puerto Rico. 
Most of the calls ended up being answered by staff members of the offices or simple interns. He would use various different vulgar words and threats while calling them, threatening to kill them on at least one occasion, apparently. Often, he would threaten to at least injure them in various ways. Some of his calls that have been made public made threats such as, I will kill you, I am going to run you over, I will kill you with a bomb or a grenade. While there was no evidence that he was actually going to carry any of these threats out, he was still a massive nuisance and tied up phones for months. He would call one single office over 500 times before giving up. When he was told that what he was doing was illegal, he decided to start masking his phone number in different ways. He continued making these calls until he was eventually found and arrested. Eventually, he went on to plead guilty to one count of making interstate communications with a threat to kidnap or injure, and one of making repeated phone calls. The first charge has him facing five years, while the second risks two years. Matthew Graves, the U.S. Attorney for D.C., said in a statement, This case should send a clear message that while people are secure in their rights to express themselves, they are not allowed to threaten people and those who do will be held accountable. Aid will be sentenced late this August. And boy, this one is... New York City's rat-hating mayor is ticketed for rats again. The mayor of New York City, Eric Adams, is known for his hatred of rats. In fact, he frequently exclaims, I hate rats, on various occasions. Once, he even demonstrated a device that would capture rats and drown them in fluid. He was even called the Rat Czar when he posted ads seeking trained mercenaries who could commit what he called wholesale slaughter of the city's rats. Well, as it turns out, the mayor was once ticketed for a rat infestation at a property he owned in Brooklyn. He challenged those tickets, but they would not be his last. In fact, they weren't nearly his last. He was ticketed four separate times for having rat infestations at his properties. Well, now he's been hit with a fifth ticket. Now it has been claimed that his newest property has a classic Tom and Jerry style mouse hole at the front of the staircase with rat turds strewn all about. He now plans to contest this ticket as well. One of his spokespersons, Liz Garcia, has said, the mayor prides himself on keeping his property clean. He will review the summons and follow all standard procedures. The mayor has said that he has spent over $7,000 trying to get rid of the pests on his property. It's no wonder he hates rats. But, in the grand scheme of things, he appears to be losing the war. Once again, thank you for watching my video. If you found it interesting, please give me a like. It really helps me out in the algorithm. And hey, feel free to subscribe if you want to see more content like this. Just recently, by popular demand, I've got my own merch store, so be sure to check that out. I've also started a podcast with four of my friends called the NBR Podcast. If you like this channel, I'm sure you'll like that one too. Go ahead and follow me on social media too, that's always nice. And I also really appreciate it when people follow me on Patreon. There you can get videos early, ad-free, and uncensored. Channel memberships will get you the same thing as well. Once again, this has been your host Kyle. Thank you, and good night.